Good afternoon and welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Ian Record. I serve as a governance policy and strategy consultant for Native nations and organizations, including the National Congress of American Indians. Um, I previously served as Vice President of Tribal Governance and Special Projects with NCAI, which is one of the reasons that I'm going to be uh, serving as your moderator today. Uh, it is my honor to serve in that role uh, for the second webinar in NCN's four-part series, which launches its groundbreaking Why Native Small Businesses Matter and How to Grow Them animated video series. This series is a, uh, of three short videos is designed to educate current and future tribal leaders, key decision makers, citizens, other Indian country stakeholders, and non-Native policymakers about the vital importance of Native-owned small businesses to the rebuilding of vibrant Native economies and how tribal governments can best support the cultivation of a vibrant small business ecosystem in and around tribal lands. And in our webinar today, we will focus on how Native nations should assess the current state of their small business development environments to identify and implement solutions that will strengthen the institutional, infrastructural, and resource systems that Native-owned small businesses need to flourish. And to delve into this topic today, we are honored to have with us Heather Fleming and Derek Harder. Heather is co-founder and executive director of Change Labs, an organization supporting entrepreneurship and innovation on the Navajo Nation. She engages partners in and around the Navajo Nation to incubate, finance, and train new and prospective entrepreneurs in an effort to diversify local economies and promote innovation. Derek Harder serves as a business analyst with the Office of Economic Policy of the Lummi Nation Business Council, the governing body of the Lummi Nation. Derek is a part of the team at Lummi that has been working to grow the nation's comprehensive economic development approach, an approach that centers the cultivation of native entrepreneurs. This approach is featured in NCAI's new Building Tribal Economies Toolkit as an effective approach that other uh, native nations can learn from. Um, before we uh, hear from our panelists, Heather and Derek today, we are gonna share the three uh, animated videos and I wanted to just give you a quick summary of those before we um, start playing them. Uh, the three-part animated video series, um, NCI had this idea way back uh, when I was still on staff, um, right before COVID, we came up with the idea, we secured some funding and then COVID hit and, and other priorities took precedence and rightly so. Um, but in, uh, in the last year or so, um, I've had the great fortune of working with NCI to bring these, these videos to life. And the idea was to, to recast a lot of the, the longstanding messages we've been hearing from tribal leaders and practitioners like the two you're gonna hear from today um, about the importance of, uh, of small business development to thriving native economies. And we thought that this, this medium of animated explainer videos would be a, a very concise and compelling way for tribal leaders, key, key decision makers, citizens, and others to learn about um, what Indian country has been saying for a very long time, that native small businesses matter, they always have, and that it's it's well past time for uh, native nations to really uh, focus all of their energy on um, rekindling their longstanding uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And so the, the, the videos are broken into three parts. The first Video uh, focuses on traditional native economies and the role of social entrepreneurs in that uh, in that effort. Uh, and then the second video looks at the impacts of colonization, uh, colonial policies, and how many of those policies, the legacies of those endure to this day, and the impacts that they've had on economic development in Indian country overall, and specifically on um, the ability of native people to start and own their own businesses. And then finally, the third video um, is a comprehensive overview of the movement that has taken root across Indian country over the last 40, 50 years to recenter native-owned small businesses in tribal economy building and looks at a number, I think it's 17 total uh, strategies that, um, that we've heard from success stories that we've seen through the, um, the academic research are, are proven strategies for strengthening that ecosystem for native small business development. And that's what we're really gonna be focusing in on today. So 
without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Suzanne to play the the videos, uh, and then we'll um, we'll get started with our panelists afterwards. Suzanne. What is a native economy? It's the constellation of self-governed economic activities a native people choose to do together in accordance with their cultural, social, ecological, and political values and institutions. The goal of a native economy is to nourish and sustain that people's distinct sense of identity, belonging, place, balance, and relationships with one another and the natural world, enabling them to flourish on their own terms. Since time immemorial, Native peoples have flourished through their sacred design and maintenance of sophisticated, adaptive economies, often in the face of harsh conditions and changing circumstances. At the heart of a native economic life were robust local and intertribal systems of commerce. Everyone in the community contributed to these systems, male and female, young and old, leaders and followers. Rigorous training practices equipped individuals and groups with specialized knowledge and skills to make those contributions. These training practices also instilled the value of reciprocity, the profound obligation to play their designated roles, and a deep understanding of how community members' well-being relied on the contributions of others. They were basket weavers, food harvesters, canoe carvers, fishers, tool makers, large and small game hunters, hide tanners, corn growers, and the list goes on and on. Called social entrepreneurs today, they were resourceful and tireless. The community counted on them to sustainably produce and provide vital goods and services that promoted the common good, not just for today, but for generations to come. Traditionally, Native peoples also embraced a deep abiding commitment to recirculate these economic resources as many times as possible. They did this within the community through gifting and exchange, and beyond through wide-ranging trade networks with other Native peoples. They understood from long experience that by prioritizing this interdependence, or as some people call it, the multiplier effect, they would maximize long-lasting benefits of their economic contributions so all community members could flourish. That was video one and then on to video two. Colonialism turned Native economies upside down. It decimated Native governance institutions and trade networks and severed Native peoples from the places they depended on for their sustenance. Instead of prioritizing regenerative activities that cultivated, circulated, and grew local economic resources within and between Native communities, Colonial policies and institutions extracted economic resources from Native communities for the benefit of dominant society. They did this until those resources were diminished or destroyed. A Native community's livelihood once depended on everyone in the community doing their part. But now, economic development involved only the few tribal leaders and citizens who were needed to secure the removal of resources from Native lands for the benefit of non-Natives. The economic health of Native communities was no longer determined by Native agency and production, but rather by outside market forces and the ulterior motives of states, Congress, the administration, and the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, 
Native social entrepreneurs, once the wellspring of Native prosperity, were actively excluded from this new economic equation. The devastating effects of this systematic suppression of Native economies endure today, including tribal economic strategies that focus only on launching large businesses that the tribal nation can own and operate, increasing federal funding to support community members and attracting outside investors to the community, limited opportunities for community members to play the valued economic roles they once did, which has made some people dependent on the government for their welfare and prompted others to take their talents elsewhere, a dynamic known as brain drain, widespread disregard for native entrepreneurs as an economic force leaving them little access to the infrastructure, resources, and technical assistance needed to start and grow businesses in Native communities and driving those who do largely underground. Weak local systems of commerce with few places for community members to get what they need, forcing them to venture outside of the community to do so. Severe economic leakage where the financial resources a Native community has immediately leaves it before it can recirculate, greatly weakening their power to bring lasting benefits to the entire community. Limited community understanding of and appreciation for the core cultural value of doing business with one's fellow community members and Native communities that are economically isolated from one another with little, if any, trade between them. Overall, the systematic suppression of Native economies has left Native communities with limited ability to foster self-determined economic growth and long-term community prosperity. And last but not least, video three, and this is uplifting and I hope energizing for folks who care about this topic. Over the past several decades, a self-determination renaissance has swept across Indian country. Tribal nations are uprooting the oppressive colonial policies and institutions that have greatly harmed their communities by once again seizing the reins of self-governance. In the process, they are rebuilding native economies that enact their cultural values and long-range visions for a vibrant future. For a growing number, this means reconnecting with their age-old entrepreneurial spirit by making the cultivation of local small businesses owned by tribal citizens a central foundation of their efforts to revitalize tribal systems of commerce and foster sustainable economic growth on their own terms. These nations are forging blueprints for success, featuring effective strategies that are proving useful for other tribal nations. These include implementing a trauma-informed plan to help tribal citizens heal and become prepared to play the roles that revitalizing the tribal nation's economy require, codifying a comprehensive small business development initiative in the nation's economy rebuilding approach and dedicating the financial and human resources it needs to take root and grow defining the distinct type of businesses the nation and its citizens should own and how the citizen-owned businesses can help meet the community's needs. Assessing the current state of the nation's economy, including the severity of economic leakage from the community, how to stem that leakage by working with native entrepreneurs, and the nation's capacity to build a thriving citizen-owned business ecosystem. Creating a robust system of tribal laws to foster citizen-owned business development and growth like a uniform tribal commercial code. Consistently enforcing those laws through an independent and properly resourced judicial mechanism that fairly resolves commercial disputes. Building a culture of accountability to those laws through ongoing tribal leader and staff trainings and community education helping citizens launch and grow small businesses through streamlined business licensing, site leasing, and related regulations, education, training, and technical assistance, financial assistance, and building the physical and digital infrastructure they need. 
providing Native entrepreneurs with integrated support like startup and growth capital, training, business plan development, and market feasibility studies through partnerships with Native nonprofits, CDFIs, co-ops, tribal colleges and universities, chambers of commerce, small business development centers, and others. Developing an economic profile that documents the skills and interests of the tribal workforce, the citizen-owned small businesses in the community, tribal and regional market forecasting, and how the citizen-owned business community can evolve to meet future market needs. Creating a procurement policy requiring that tribal government and tribal enterprises do business with certified citizen-owned businesses first and other native-owned businesses second and helping those businesses become certified. Launching a permanent Buy Native campaign so that everyone understands the financial, social, and cultural benefits citizen-owned businesses provide. Promoting local citizen-owned businesses to other Native communities, the surrounding region, and the world. Modestly taxing citizen-owned businesses and reinvesting that revenue in their growth through loans, marketing, training, and technical assistance. Holding the federal government accountable to its trust and treaty obligations to fund Native small businesses and engaging state governments and philanthropic partners to do the same. Learning from the innovations of other tribal nations to strengthen the nation's development of a healthy ecosystem for citizen-owned businesses. And celebrating successful citizen-owned businesses within the community and beyond. When tribal nations embrace these strategies, they nurture a vibrant economy producing a multitude of benefits, including more local jobs, keeping more dollars circulating within the community and keeping talented, hardworking tribal citizens at home, a reduced cost of living and an improved quality of community life, the emergence of new role models for native youth, and ultimately, a strong and resilient foundation upon which to flourish as Native people once again. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and as you saw there in the closing credits, we had the great fortune of having um, the script and then the animations for these three videos um, informed by uh, a group of content contributors, including Heather uh, and also Derek's colleague, Sean Lawrence, um, uh, and, and a number of others who do this work for a living of, of figuring out how to strengthen ecosystems for native small business development. Um, you know, learning from from what tribes have been doing and sharing with other tribes. And um, we sort of got the we got the the a listers together and said, okay, what messages do we want to impart through these three videos? And then we also had the great fortune of of hearing from um in the narration, um Alice Glenn, who's a Anupiak um, uh, Anupiak woman who's uh, doing a, some really cool stuff in media up in up in uh, Alaska in her home state. So, um, we're, we're going to move now to our, the panel, uh, part of our, uh, session today. And, um, before we get started with Heather, I did want to just mention for folks, if you, if you have questions for either Heather or Derek, uh, please go ahead and place them in the Q and a box. You'll see at the bottom of the zoom screen, there's a Q and a, uh, box there. You just click on that and you can add your question in. And then once we get to the Q and a portion after both of them present, we'll get to as many of your, um, We'll get to as many of your uh, questions as we can. Um, and you'll also notice that Suzanne is placing into the uh, chat the links, the direct links to each of the three videos. Um, and um, we encourage you to, you know, watch them again, to share them with anyone else who you think might be interested. And importantly, um, we're in the process of developing two companion guides for these uh, for these videos, one for tribal nations, 
uh, to help inform their strategic decision making and action around this topic, and then one for tribal colleges and universities so that the videos can be taught in a comprehensive manner uh, in the classroom. So with that, I will I will gladly turn the floor over to Heather. Um, I'm, I'm always excited to hear her share because uh, Change Labs is doing some extraordinary work and it's kind of hard to keep up with all the cool stuff you guys are doing. So Heather, please take it away. Thanks, Ian. That's very kind. Yat a everybody. Sha'a Heather Fleming and Ishia. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Navajo Nation. And I'm excited to see some attendees here that I know. Shout out to my friends, Al Henderson. I saw Pam Eaton, Blue Adams. I'm so glad to see some, I can't see your faces, but at least some friendly names. So I know there's some friendly people out there. I just wanted to take a bit of time to share with you all a little bit about what Change Labs is, and then also how we always talk about ourselves as an ecosystem building organization. So what does that mean to us? What is the framework that we use? And I really love video three because it paints this beautiful picture of what our economies could and will look like when we fully embrace and support native entrepreneurship. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that they mentioned in there that we're employing at Change Labs and some of the challenges that we faced and um, the struggles that we've had. So, so for a quick context, I imagine most people here don't know what Change Labs is. Our, our URL is just nativestartup.org if you want to check it out while I'm talking. We are a 501c3, it's so a nonprofit. We're located in Tuba City, Arizona. Technically, though anybody on the call from Shiprock can dispute me, the largest community on Navajo. And we do a variety of things. I sum it up like this. We provide creative workspace tools, resources, and knowledge for Native entrepreneurs. And I can give some example of what that programming looks like. But the long and short of it is that we're a Native-led nonprofit organization embedded within the community that is trying to foster and enable Native entrepreneurship. And we, we can talk about what that looks like. So when I mentioned that we have an ecosystem framework that we utilize, this is what it looks like. And we did not create this. I put a little link down at the bottom, or not a link, but a shout out. I originally got introduced to this image or this framework through Babson College, but I don't know if they took it from somewhere else. So I don't really know who is the originator of these six categories. I just know that when we, when we saw this or when we were exposed to it, it really resonated with the experience that we had. When I say we, I specifically mean myself and my, my co-founder, Jessica Stego. So when we think about entrepreneurship, it's it, especially on Navajo, it's not like there's just one problem that needs to be solved. There's a whole variety, I call these levers, like six levers that all need to be pulled. And arguably they all need to be pulled at the same time in order for the, the ecosystem to be strengthened. We used to have these debates early on, like, well, if we just focus on policy, will that, is that enough? Or if we just focus on human capital, is that enough? And over time, I think what we learned when we were prototyping different programs and activities is that no, it really, we really gotta be trying to lift all of them at the same time. And that of course just makes our work harder because Funders always say specific is terrific. Like, tell me the one thing that you guys do really well. Well, we can't just do one thing. We can't afford to do one thing because the problem that we're trying to tackle is so complex and challenging that there's like six things that we need to be doing at the same time and trying to elevate them all at once. And of course, we're a six person organization. So how realistic is that? So I'll show you what we do do around this and then where we leverage partnerships to try and tackle all six levers at the same time. Um, but before I go there, I did want to share with you that a lot of when we were looking at this framework and, and synthesizing a lot of our observations and collecting data, we ended up publishing a study in 2020. And I think there's going to be a link that pops up in the chat. If not, if you have your phone, you can scan this QR code that's on the slide. But we 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 use indicators established by the World Bank. They publish indicators on the that um, 
that measure the ease of doing business in any given region. And the World Bank collects these indicators in 190 countries around the globe, at least they used to. So we borrowed those indicators and we, we collected the data so that we could measure how easy is it to start a business on the Navajo Nation versus other countries, versus the US, versus a, um, a border town, versus China, versus Portugal, whatever it may be. <laughs> and um, what, we, we, what we found is that we weren't crazy, <laughs> that all of these anecdotes that had been shared with us over the years, like people saying, this is really hard, is it just me? And worse off, like people questioning, like, am I dumb? Am I just not able to get through this? It wasn't them, it, it is hard. And in fact, if you look at the, the metrics that we have here, the Navajo Nation ranks in the bottom 15% of countries around the globe when it comes to three things. The first is getting access to land. The second is getting access to electricity to start your new business. And the third is enforcing contracts. And that all just kind of feeds back into this ecosystem because for us, it was really important to establish this baseline so that we know how do we know how do we know the things that we're doing that 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 we're making measurable improvements towards those things, or if we're just doing great stuff but it's not actually doing anything, we're we're trying to be very conscientious of of tying the things that we're doing to measurable outcomes that we can refer back to the baseline or like look back at our ecosystem. I definitely encourage you guys to check out that study if you have a time. There is an executive summary because I think it's 30 pages or so, but um, it was really an enlightening exercise for us. So in going through that process and also just, again, collecting hundreds of sticky notes over five years time from entrepreneurs telling us what their challenges are, these are the six things that we kind of coalesce or synthesize as as the issues that need to be tackled specifically within our community, Navajo, Western Agency, Tuba City. So on the finance side, I think it's pretty well documented that there's a severe lack of access to, I would say relevant and, and culturally relevant um, uh, uh, financial products for native people. So how do we carve paths to access finance? Specifically finance that funds the startup as businesses as well as growth. Um, how, on the human capital end, how do we modernize and strengthen our workforce on the Navajo Nation? Modernize, I think, being the key word there. On the support side, how do we establish the necessary infrastructure, expertise, and support systems that enable entrepreneurs to thrive? So this is everything from physical infrastructure all the way to just the fact that we don't, we don't have the luxury of generational entrepreneurship in a lot of our communities like they do in border towns or non non native communities. Um, in fact, we have we our problem. It's not even just about generational entrepreneurship. It's just about the fact that some members of our community don't even like the word entrepreneurship or or business or or that you could even be accused of being an apple by even going down that path in the first place. So how do we create those role models or shifting over to the next level? lever, um, what, what are the cultural aspects that we need to address? And in our, we define that as what, what, how, do we, how do we build a new narrative about what it even means to be a Native American entrepreneur and foster a culture that rewards tolerance and risk? And I would say that's an underlying thing to everything that we do at Change Labs. It's not like there's a program focused on culture. It's more like in the language that we use, the imagery that we collect, the stories that we tell, all of it is about celebrating entrepreneurship and trying to dismantle this idea that business owners are greedy people who are just trying to accumulate wealth for themselves and not trying to, to uh, support the community. Markets is a big one, especially since reservations are, you know, their own sovereign land. So how do we identify opportunities and capitalize on both on and off reservation markets so that we can stimulate local economies? Economic leakage is, is a big, big challenge on Navajo, and it's definitely something that needs to be addressed both at the market and the policy side. It's funny, when we collected the stickies, I would say the vast majority of the stickies ended up in the policy bucket just because of bureaucracy, um, perceived apathy, 
uh, complexity, money. So how, how do we continue to educate, research, collect data and catalyze conversations um, on the benefits of pro-business policies? That's why I was really excited to hear that this video series was coming out. I think it touches on a lot of these levers and really, it really, really tied into a lot of the themes that we had seen in our community. So here's, I'm just gonna quickly share what um, Change Labs programming looks like and also tie it back to some of the uh, 17 interventions that were proposed in the third video. So first and foremost, tying back to that support, support lever and the human capital lever, we have these physical spaces. Our first one is in Tuba and we're working on a second one now that hopefully will open at the end of this year. People just need a place to go where they can access Wi-Fi, work at a desk, um, print a document. I can't, I can't tell you how many sticky notes we get about people not having a printer at their house or even reliable electricity to that extent. And a place where they can talk to somebody about a business or about their business goals or where they can figure out like who can who can do this graphic design work for me or who's who's a native accountant in my community a centralized hub we call them eship hubs um, where people can go to access that the information that they need the thing that frustrates me about this one is that it's so simple it's dumb but we really we just don't have these sorts of resources in the community and it, to me it ties back to the the eighth intervention that was mentioned in that in that and the third film, how do we enhance citizens' readiness to launch and grow small businesses to streamlining a lot of this? Like, there's a place, one place that you can go to get a lot of this stuff done. Um, the next thing that we do, or some other things that we do, I I couldn't fit them all in this presentation, but we do have. There was there was a one of the interventions was about a buy native campaign. So Change Labs initiated this platform a few years ago called Res Rising that currently has a little over 650 native owned businesses listed in this directory. So the next time you need like ceremonial supplies or you need a graphic designer, you can just pull up Res Rising and figure out who's in my community or who's, who's in Flagstaff or who's in Phoenix. And I think there's a lot of efforts like this going on right now, which is great. We're actually looking to partner with another organization that can do this better than us and to, to kind of hand off our database to them. But I think this is the kind of traction that we need is because so many of our businesses are invisible, how do we, how do we help make them more visible? And then um, similarly, we have a platform called Build Navajo that's all about simplifying the business registration process on the Navajo Nation. So that goes back to this idea of how, how do organizations or tribes like streamline information, make it consistent, make it accessible so that it's not such a hindrance to, to start um, a new business. We also have uh, our, I would say this is probably our flagship program. A lot of people know us for our business incubator. My co-founder Jess started the business incubator many, many years ago. This will be the 10th anniversary is it what year is it yeah 10th anniversary 2024 <laughs> we are actually changing the incubator quite a bit this year very exciting but it's all about how do we bring together these community of entrepreneurs who always tell us that they feel very isolated and that they even receive backlash sometime for trying to do what they're doing how do we bring them together so that they can meet other people who are like them and learn from their experiences, create new shared experiences, celebrate each other's success, and also kind of as a team, as a group, kind of identify where the gaps are and where we need to build capacity. Well, I can tell you many times when we have these alumni gatherings or these groups coming together, they all recognize like we need more accountants or we need more graphic designers that are on the reservation, or we need a photographer in this community who can do brand photography. I think that's a really, fostering and building that community has been a really big learning for us. And then um, I'm glad to see that Al Henderson is on this call. Al Henderson was one of the co-founders of the, the Diné Chamber of Commerce back in the day. And we currently collaborate with them and also another Navajo nonprofit called the ACES School on our policy advocacy. 
And the intervention that was mentioned in the video is kind of like assessing the current state of a nation's economy, economic leakage, all of that, and then creating a robust system of tribal laws that foster citizen-owned businesses. There's so much work to be done here. It almost feels overwhelming at times, which is why we don't try and do this on our own. It's, it's a coalition-led initiative. So at the moment, what we do in partnership with other organizations is we run these public policy events. It's called All Roads Lead to Chaco Canyon. And it's it's primarily an education event where we take research like what we've done, that study that I shared, the, doing business on the Navajo Nation. We did one on tax legislation. Um, we're about to publish one on how we how you can ease the lending environment on the Navajo Nation. Bringing that information back to communities, back to our elected leaders, back to our executive offices, so that we can begin to just be more mindful of how and when we create policies and don't over create an over regulated environment for businesses. The last one that I'm going to mention, and I I'll pause is um is lending. You know, access to finance is such a big gap for us. And um, we have a microloan program that currently awards loans up to 10K for startups, but we're expanding that. And I think my, my counterpart here on the panel is going to talk about their work with SSBCI. Change Labs is also an SSBCI partner um, with the Navajo Nation. And we're excited to be expanding our loan program by several million dollars this year. I think we will have a, a goal to deploy 7 million in loans to Navajo entrepreneurs over the next three years. So there's a lot going on here. It feeds directly into building human, human capital and also creating access to finance, which is are both critical gaps in that, in that ecosystem. So here's what it looks like when I map our work to those levers. And again, for us, culture is an underlying thing of everything that we do. So it's not so much that we have a program that are, um, specifically addresses it. It's more like it's the foundation of, it's a starting point for everything. But we, we, I often feel like we're trying to do too much, which again, it's a big problem. There's a lot to tackle, but how do we be strategic about what it is that we do how do we continuously learn from what we do? And how do we enforce this culture within our team to let things go if it's not working and just have, keep that ability to just like try again or start afresh or take these learnings and, and redesign it. So I'm gonna pause there. I'm gonna share my contact info in case anybody is interested and I will hand it back to Ian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's extraordinary what you guys have done in such a short period of time and um, so excited for the future. And honestly, in getting the word out broader, farther and wider to folks with money, foundations, et cetera, to, to continue to grow the funding for your work. Um, so with that, we're going to turn to uh, Derek and I'm going to be sharing the screen on his behalf. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, as I mentioned earlier, Derek is... Um, Part of a team there at Lummi that is um, that is working to implement uh, their community economic development strategy that uh, is in part um, well a couple of things that are really really key about it. One is that it's it, as we mentioned it it's it centers entrepreneurship, uh, which is you know the reason we brought them uh, here to share today, but also it. Um, but also it, uh, it it flows from the will of the Lummi people, which I think is really key. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, when, when you hear Derek talk, he's gonna delve into how everything that they're doing now um, derives from a multi-year pro uh, process that uh, was all about hearing from the Lummi people and learning what their priorities are and then um, making those priorities a reality. So, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Ian, and thank you for uh, to everyone for being on here today. My name is Derek Carter. I'm the business analyst for the Office of Economic Policy. Um, I've been here at LIBC for approximately seven years. Um, 
So our department essentially serves as the Department of Commerce for the Lummi Nation. Uh, our mission is to analyze, plan, implement, and administer government economic policies and actions necessary for increasing the standard of living of Lummi tribal members, advancing self-determination, and improving the sustainable economic health and prosperity of Lummi Nation's public and private sector to empower our tribal members and entities to do more now and in the future in order to preserve, promote, and protect our Chilean. So that is a little bit about our department and what we do. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So Lummi Nation is a self-sovereign and self-governing tribe. The Lakamish have called the Salish Sea home since time immemorial. Um, for millennia, the reef net was key to our way of life, uh, which is known as the Sh our Shalangan. Uh, enabling us to feed our people and trade with other nations. In 1855, the Lummi, Lummi Nation and the United States formally recognized one another and signed the Treaty of Point Elliot. Today, our homeland is the Lummi Indian Reservation, uh, which is actually approximately 13,500 acres. The Lummi Nation continues to govern its own affairs, investing in the education and training of our people, developing our economy, and holding true to our values. Our mission is, is to promote, preserve, and, uh, sorry, is to protect, preserve, and promote our Shalangan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so this is a little bit about the Lummi people. Um, there, we have the largest tribal fishing fleet in North America. Um, there's pro approximately 500 tribal fishermen and women. Um, top left is King Salmon, which is commonly fished here and throughout the Salish Sea. And on the right is the Dungeness crab, um, which uh, is very popular in this area. Um, bottom left is another lum uh, Lummi fisherman holding a halibut. And in the middle image is herring. And on the right is sea urchin. Uh, all of these is um, uh, is the Shalangan of the Lummi people. It's their way of life. It provides sustenance for the people and economic prosperity. As for the res reservation population, there are 5,322 enrolled Lummi tribal members, approximately 53% live on the reservation, which is about 2,800. Uh, the Lummi Nation provides social services to all spouses and children of Lummi tri as tribal members, resulting in the service population of over 16,000. One thing that wasn't mentioned here is uh, the service population also includes other uh, tribal members enrolled in other tribes throughout the United States uh, that are living on the reservation and throughout Whatcom County. There are over 2,200 residences on the reservation. Um, beginning in the 1950s, non-Indians began moving to the scenic shoreline on the prop, uh, shoreline property. So today, about 59% of the homes are owned by non-Indians. Next slide, please. So this also resulted in the reservation uh, becoming a checkerboard of land ownership, much of which is non-Indian fee land. This creates a challenge in that the tribe pays for all police, infrastructure, and other government services on the reservation, yet non-Indian non -Indian residents pay property tax to the county and not to the tribe. And so another challenge is that Whatcom County's unauthorized zoning of the reservation in 2011, the county downzoned hundreds of acres of, uh, of Lummi owned lands on the reservation, essentially canvassing almost everything as R R5, which is uh, one, resident, one resident unit per five acres of land. Uh, so, downzoned sites include the Silver Reef Casino and Lummi Administration Center, and there is only one authorized um, land use zoning, sorry, land, Lummi land use zoning map shown here. And so if you, if you were to go on the Whatcom County uh, website, it would show their, their zoning map would even recognize Lummi Nation as being its own uh, municipal government and it have its own zoning for those properties, uh, which is completely incorrect. And, and so the zoning is what you see for zoning for the properties is what you see here. So in addition to social and emergency services, the Lummi Nation also directly provides or contracts for all other government services, which includes natural resources, pre-K to 12 education, enrollment, courts, restorative justice, cultural, tarot, record and archives, economic development, public works and planning, or public works planning and permitting, also includes uh, um, our in-house attorney's office. 
Uh, here's the Lemonian Business Council. This is uh, there's 11 elected council members that uh, serve the Lemonation for the government that are elected by the general council members of Lemonation, which is the voting membership of the tribe. Um, and here's inside the Lemonation Administration Building. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, our Lemme Nation enterprises. Uh, we have two uh, economic enterprises. The main one is Lemme Commercial Company, which runs the Silver Reef Casino. Uh, they also own and operate the Loomis Trail Golf Course and three convenience stores located around the uh, Lemme Reservation, which includes one of them being off reservation next to I-5, known as the Salish, Salish Village Feeling Center. Another uh, economic enterprise not uh, listed here is the Lummi Development Holding Company, uh, and they have many other subsidiaries underneath them. The Lummi Indian Business Council says, um, we just had an update last year, five-year update, so 2023 to 2027. It's used as a guide to understand the regional economy, uh, description of current economic and demographics of the region, SWOT analysis, our industry clusters, uh, list economic development goals and objectives, and clear lines of communication and outreach within the general public, uh, government decision makers, and businesses. So the overview of the process, annual revision, there's also a five-year revision. Uh, there is a SEDS committee that overviews that. Uh, my coworker, Teresa Taylor, is the one who updates the SEDS every year. Um, and so that is part of, as part of a grant through the Economic Development Administration, uh, EDA. And so our business clusters that we focus on is the Salish Village, which is next to I-5, our Gooseberry Point, which is uh, essentially our marina uh, hub, and uh, Lego Bay, which is, uh, is on the Lummi Island within the San Juan Islands. Um, so the data we focus on is economic impacts, educational attainment, the uh, population and employment projections, housing, household income, the po poverty rate, unemployment rate, age, and veteran status. So the reason why we do this is so we can check in on our progress, make sure that all our projects are uh, going on timeline and on track. Uh, it's required to make informed decisions, gathering input to assess effectiveness of the committee and strategy. Next steps would be to review performance metrics, gather input from community leaders and businesses, update our work plan and approve, approve 2024 project list. Some of our recent and active projects include uh, MBR wastewater expansion, uh, that stands for membrane bioreactor. Um, and then the Quina Village Apartments is another housing here on the reservation, uh, phase two, uh, so additional apartment complex buildings. Our Shalangan Village Transitional Housing, which was just finished last year, uh, which includes four uh, buildings of four units each. Um, Sandy Point Wastewater Expansion, um, Selfish Hatchery Expansion, the Youth Wellness Center, the Quina Corridor, um, Salish Village Project, um, which is where our fueling station is located next to I-5, and we own 80 acres of, of land there that is going to be developed in several phases. Right now we're in phase two, which is um, we'll have seven retail out pads um, that are basically pad ready to go, and there's been RFQs uh, put out for that. Um, so we're waiting to get responses to further development out there. And then our Fisherman's Cove store, which is down by the Gooseberry uh, marina cluster. Some other projects that weren't included, included here was our Northwest Indian College. They're expanding a new health and wellness center, uh, which includes a gymnasium and a fitness center there on the campus for their students to provide um, and essentially um, provides a new gym for the men's, men's and women's basketball teams. Uh, they didn't currently have a home gym, so they're really uh, thankful that that's being uh, built now. So Derek, quick quick question. I noticed there's Lummi Vendor Marketplace here listed at the bottom of the slide. Can you share a little bit more about that given that it's, I assume it's focused on uh, your entrepreneurs? Yeah, sorry, I missed that. It was cut off on my screen. Um, the Lummi Vendor Marketplace, uh, we were awarded a 4.6 million grant uh, in 2022 from the EDA. 
um, and that's to stimulate economic growth for our tribal entrepreneurs in the area. It's actually much similar to the hub that Heather was talking about. Uh, some of the most common barriers to entry for small business owners is access to capital and a location for them to uh, run their business. And so this is one way of us eliminating the barriers for location. We can provide a centralized hub um, marketplace for Lemme entrepreneurs to operate out of that location. So it's, it's going to be a 8,000, 9,000 square foot facility, and we could potentially house 20 plus uh, Lemme craftsmen, art, artisans, um, food vendors, uh, fish vendors, and other professional services uh, vendors there and kind of have an informational booth about um, other Lemme owned businesses that aren't located there or give more online services um, um, to the community. And so it's gonna, it'll be located um, on the co Northwest corner of the Lemme Indian Reservation, closer to the city of Ferndale and closer to the interstate. So it, it also um, uh, won't be as, as rural towards um, basically the Lummi Peninsula, so it would be more easily accessible for um, consumers. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> Make sure we're on the right page, there we go. Yeah, so why small businesses? Uh, it reduces economic leach leakage in the community, supports economic self-sufficiency, fulfills the goals, objectives from the feds, increasing the standard of living for, living for the community. Um, I said before, we, we act as the uh, Department of Commerce. So here we are able to uh, create and certify um, limited liability companies and corporations. We're able to charter tribally owned uh, corporations and we're able to do the, help assist uh, tribal members in doing so as well. Um, we also have a business license process that goes through yearly and we have about 415 or so active business licenses on the reservation. Um, one, one, uh, another thing that we just implemented two weeks ago was we partnered with a company called Syncurrent who can provide more in-depth um, technical assistance to business startups. Um, so that just launched two weeks ago. Um, so it's, it's free to all Lemmy Tribal members to where they can get uh, more in-depth technical assistance in Right, creating their business plan, marketing, and other needs that, that they, they have for starting their business. So preference in contracting is related to our procurement policy. Uh, if we're going to contract with anyone, uh, we need to have a, a native preference first, um, essentially wanting to do business in Indian country. Uh, you have to give justification if you're not going to do that, if you're going to sole source a contract. Um, that's kind of more just in-house policy. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we awarded the EDA grant to construct the Lemmy Vendor Marketplace. Um, and so in the meantime, we support entrepreneurs by sponsoring events. We do the holiday bazaar and other holiday, um, like around Thanksgiving events through throughout the city of Ferndale or the city of Bellingham to promote our entrepreneurs, to give them a place to, um, to generate and revenue and stimulate more economic activity. Uh, we are also tracking quarterly tribal member owned businesses for, uh, for throughout registration. Like I said, it's about 415, 420 uh, um, businesses operating on the Lemmy Indian Reservation. It's about 150 Lummi tribal uh, owned businesses. Um, so we also require non-tribal businesses to be licensed to do, have any, engage in any business activities on the reservation. That's through our uh, Lummi Coil of Laws that requires that. Um, that is it for today on our side for Lummi. So uh, if you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A chat. Um, and we'll get to them there. Thank you. We do have a we do have a question for you, Derek, right off the bat. What was the name of the company working with the Lummi Nation with TA for business startups? I don't know if I think you mentioned. Oh, yeah, Syncurrent. Uh, S Y N C U R R E N T. Syncurrent. Okay. Um, and then we had a, we had another question, uh, and this is for both of you. 
Uh, do you have or do you know of a database available um, out there, I assume online, for for grants and funding available to native native owned small businesses? Like where do you where do you where do you guys send if you can't lend to the the native owned small business yourself, where do you <clears throat> what do you connect them with in terms of potential sources of capital? Uh, I typically send uh, anyone looking for loans to Lemmy CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution. Just this last November, they changed their name to Pacific Northwest Lending. They were formed in 2006 and they're a state, Washington State chartered nonprofit. Um, they provide, they're a native CDFI and they provide a lot of financial assistance and startup loans to uh, tribal members in the area. Our government does not provide any um, does not provide any uh, lending or loan financing. So that's one thing that we can also look into for, for maybe establishing another program or so, but that's where we refer them. Yeah, and, and Heather, same question to you. I know you I know you guys have to get real creative to find financing for your folks. <laughs> I don't know of a centralized database. All I know well, for us, if somebody comes in with that question, we get a lot of um, emails probably on a daily basis with grant opportunities and we put them all on our resources page on our website. And we have one team member whose job is to keep that current because there's new stuff coming out all the time. I just got one this morning that had like a billion federal grants for native tribes and, and entrepreneurs or specifically around um, economic development. Something like that we probably wouldn't put in our resource because it's just so big, but um, I do not know of a centralized database <laughs> to answer the question. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty well versed in this subject, and I ha, I'm not aware of one either. Um, and I, I know I know that other orgs like like Change Labs and and other other tribes like Lummi, um, they will you know that that have focused um, intensely on this issue and creating that ecosystem do have you know locally kind of a local listing of potential sources of where you can go. Like, oh, you know this this uh, credit union has worked with entrepreneurs in the past, or you can you can approach this foundation and secure up to this amount of money, um, and that sort of thing. Um, I you know I think in 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 my work with uh, Native Community Development Financial Institutions and Derek mentioned uh, Pacific Northwest Tribal Lending, which is you know chartered by the Lummi Nation um, to to serve the the financing needs of Lummi citizens. Um, that there's a there's a real need for that long-term patient capital um, to be invested from the outside in um, native CDFI so they can offer low interest um, business startup and business growth capital to um, to native entrepreneurs um, because it's key you know because you know not every not every um, not every native community has change labs and not every native community has you know a, a, a tribal government that is that has built out the infrastructure for entrepreneurs to the degree that you guys have and, you know, having those native CDFIs with not just the loan capital, but the, the ability to invest that intensive one-on-one -on -one time you need um, to make sure that those, the entrepreneur knows whether their business can be a success in the, in the local market um, or the regional market, how they, um, how they need to structure their business plan and actually live that plan once it's created uh, and, and where they can go for help is, is critical. Um, Derek, I had a, um, I had a question for you as we're um, and we 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 encourage attendees to put their any other questions they have in the chat. But question for you, you know, we were chatting uh, briefly before the webinar started about the fact that all of the work that you outline now um, at Lummi really grows out of a multi-year um, citizen engagement process that Lummi went through called Lummi Ventures, um, where you know you 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 did this intensive engagement um, process with. Um, citizens from all walk, you know, tribal members from all walk of, walks of life in, in the community and it sort of distilled out what's the consensus of what they want to see for Lummi's future, culturally, economically, et cetera. And within the economic realm, it really was, we want, we want our entrepreneurs to be uplifted, to, to be um, supported in growing. And we want to grow the number of them and the size of them and, and things like that, and make sure that they have every chance to, to live the, to live the, the business life that they want to live, to live the professional life they want to live and be able to provide for not just themselves, but their families, and also provide the variety of services like Heather mentioned um, to, to the community and, and make the community a, a stronger, more vibrant place to live. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that 
that that origin story, if you will, now now drives your work. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Ian, uh, the the Ventures pr Promoting Prosperity Plan started in two thousand four, and that was uh, from a grant that was received from North Northwest Area Foundation. And so that started in 2004, and that was that was long before I, I started. I started here working at LIBC in 2017, and that program stopped in 2016. But <clears throat> it paved the way uh, by identifying the values that Lummi wanted to go by to to essentially set set up what's today our office, which we you know we implement those policies and programs and other sorts of um, uh, code revisions and, and recommendations like that. It also started uh, something I forgot to mention in the um, presentation was our small business incubator that was uh, first started in 2007 by our native city of I and then it was uh, the management was handed over to us in 2017 and our office uh, currently manages what's called the Tatisan Center, the small business incubator next to I-5 um, for we have about 11 to 13 uh, tenants there that operate their small business. Um, we give them another look. It's another uh, tool for providing that location. And then um, they, if they need any business plan assistance or technical assistance, they would they would utilize us. Um, any sort of needs or modifications they need done to their buildings. Like one instance, we had a salon, uh, hair salon business owner working over there and she needed expansion because she was actually serving her clients uh, and growing a lot. And so we had torn down a wall in there, expanded the area, and and it suits their needs. So they will they um they start their business and grow in there, and then eventually they'll graduate and then move on to their own own uh, place throughout the county, whether they want to operate, and then we can then take on another tenant in that time. Unfortunately, COVID nineteen has really put a um, you know damper on all that, but we're we're uh, now readjusting and 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 recovering from the effects of the pandemic, but. Uh, it's been it's been pretty successful, uh, and so the Lummi vendor marketplace will also go hand in hand since there's such a demand for high demand for Lummi owned businesses to that need a location to to operate their business. Thank you for that, Derek. And I know that the um, in the summary that's on Lummi that's included in the NCAI uh, Building Tribal Economies Toolkit, and I believe Suzanne posted that a PDF of that toolkit in the chat just a few minutes ago um that that incubator is mentioned as sort of the latest manifestation of what you guys were told by the lummy people you know um going on 15 18 years ago um over that several year period is that we, you know the the tribal government has to do everything in its power to create that fertile ecosystem and that infrastructure for lummy entrepreneurs to to um start and grow businesses um so Heather, the next question is for you. Um, it's a little bit specific, but it, it's, uh, is this new round of financial help for Navajo small businesses available for those uh, uh, native entre Navajo entrepreneurs who didn't qualify for ARPA financial assistance? I know heart. Good to not, I keep saying good to see you, but I can't see anybody, but good to see your name heart. Uh, you should definitely reach out to us. The, the, Tribe is still working on finalizing its agreement with the treasury. So the money isn't available right at the second, but it will be, I mean, I'm hopeful. I don't want, I'm going to get slapped on the hand if I commit to a date, so I'm not going to, but it will be this year, hopefully very soon. I'll leave it at that. But yes, it would be, if you didn't qualify, if you didn't qual qualify for ARPA, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't qualify for this. So in fact, I think you'd be a great candidate for it, knowing what I know about your business. And I believe you're talking, Heather, about the State Small Business Credit Initiative or mm -hmm. in DC speak, SSBCI. Yes. Um, and that's key. You know, there's um, not just Navajo, but the Pacific Northwest where where Derek is, um, affiliated tribes, Northwest Indians um, uh, apply for SSBCI money on behalf of their member tribes. Um, and, and there's a number of other um, Indian country recipients that will be receiving significant money to support native small business startup and growth. And then you couple that with all of the money that's flowing down from the federal government through the Inflation Reduction Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, in other areas like clean energy, for example, there's gonna be hundreds of millions of dollars 
coming out uh, for projects in Indian country. They're going to need uh, native entrepreneurs. You know, those those co those construction contractors, as an example, um, those um, native small business owners who are who have the types of skills and training that are going to be needed to develop these clean energy projects, um, operate them, et cetera, ma maintain them, et cetera. Um, it's, it's a critical time to support native entrepreneurs and a critical, critical opportunity to, to really ramp up their growth, um, not just within one community, but across all of Indian country. Um, and then we have another, we have another question here. And I, I think, uh, for the sake of time, this will be our last question before we wrap up. Um, how can, the question is, how can we best build engagement with tribal governments and leadership to build support for local and community member businesses versus bringing chains and corporate entities into our communities. So I don't know if either of you guys want to jump on that one first. I can I can give you the Change Labs response, which is very Navajo centric. I don't know whether or not this would apply to other tribes, but the 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 problem that we have with this on Navajo is that chains and corporate entities are treated differently than small businesses. Chains and corporate entities get to go straight through Winter Rock, whereas local community-based businesses usually have to go through their chapter. And the problem with that is that the vast majority of our chapters don't have the capacity to issue their own business site leases. So they can't just give out that land to local and community members, whereas Taco Bells and the Walmarts can just go to Winter Rock negotiate a deal with the real estate department out of, um, I think it's under the Division of Economic Development and just like get what they need to start their thing. So it's almost like they have the streamline process, whereas the local guys have to go through, sorry if there's any chapter leaders on the call, but they have to go through the chapter bureaucracy to get, um, to get that process or not even the chapter, but the regional business development offices. So I, I think that there, at least on Navajo, there's there's a lot of capacity, education, and money that needs to be invested into our local governments, our chapters, so that they can issue these business site leases. Because until they until they are able to do that, there isn't even that much land that people that local businesses and community community centric businesses could access to even start their businesses. And that's this is why, at least on Navajo, you only see the McDonald's and the Taco Bells and you don't see the mom and pop shops. It's because of this, this huge capacity gap at the chapter, the local government level, and the fact that our, our, um, our centralized government in Windorock then doesn't invest in the capacity at the, at the chapter level. So that might, yeah, that's my it's a, a unique set of challenges there, given the immense size of Navajo. You know, it's a reservation the size of the state of West Virginia, and the fact that you have, uh, you have this sort of stratified, stratified decision making where you, you know, it's the local chapter level make a lot of these key decisions versus the central government, and and obviously it doesn't sound like a very level playing field there. How about how about you, Derek? Um, in, in response to that question, um, it sounds like you're doing a lot of this work already, but um, any any insights you want to share on that question? Yeah, uh, it's a little different for Lummi Nation than than Navajo because Lummi Nation, the reservation is is rural. There's no cities or towns located in in there. They're out outside the north and to the east. Um, so we don't really have a um, issue for chains or corporate entities coming into our communities. But when we're we're developing off reservation towards I five. We're trying to focus on providing that space for tribal entrepreneurs, such as the Tatisan Center. Um, in our Salish Village Phase Two construction, we're going to have some retail out pads, and it might have some chains or corporate entities that lease uh, there on on our lands um, through a trust land leasing. But we're also going to provide another out pad strictly for uh, our Lummi entrepreneurs. So it's going to be another space for them, just like the Tatisan Center. And so that's one way we're trying to uh, promote them um, and have that support for our local community members. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we just had another request, Suzanne, if you can um, place the video links in the chat uh, for folks that may have arrived late to the, the webinar. Um, like, I, like I said, we would love, love it if you guys watch them again and really absorb everything they have to say. And then if you have, um, if you, have uh, you know, the uh, urge to share them with others. That's the whole point of it. We want this these to go viral, if you will. 
uh, and um, and and get as many eyes, uh, as many important eyes as possible on on the the videos, and then uh, connect folks in with the um, with the related resources that we're going to be um, finalizing and releasing over the next few months. Um, I wanted to just close first of all. Well, before I close, I want to I want to thank Heather and Derek. Um, great job from both of you. Learned so much and eager to learn more. And um, we are going to be making once these um, once these videos uh, from all four webinars are finalized, we'll be um, NCI will be posting them to the YouTube channel and then eventually a link to them from the NCI website, as well as some related uh, uh, resources uh, for you, those of you who are interested in this topic. Uh, did as as I mentioned at the outset, this is the um, second webinar today in our four part webinar series. And so uh, next week, we're going to have webinars on Tuesday and Thursday at the same time, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. And uh, on next Tuesday, January 30th, uh, we're going to hear from um, from two other, uh, I would call them success stories um, from across the new country, um, St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and what they're doing to, um, to uplift their tourism-based entrepreneurs, uh, and then the Confederate Salish and Kootenai Tribes in Montana who have from my perspective, probably the most advanced and most effective um, tribal procurement policy anywhere in any country um, that mandates um, that the tribal government and tribal enterprises do business with uh, small businesses owned and operated by their own entrepreneurs. And so we're going to be hearing uh, their stories. And then uh, on Thursday, February 1st, we're going to be hearing from uh, Lakota Vogel, uh, who runs uh, Four Bands Community Fund. Uh, one of the oldest and largest uh, Native community development financial institutions. Uh, and they're heavily invested in cultivating Native-owned uh, small businesses. And then uh, Pamela Standing, who runs the Minnesota Indian Business Alliance, to talk about the role of partners in um, partners with tribal governments in, in creating this ecosystem for Native entrepreneurship. And so um, you should be already, all of you here on the um, on the webinar should already be registered for all four webinars. So you should already see Zoom calendar invites uh, automatically appearing in your calendars. Um, but there's the, um, there's a registration QR code there uh, in case you want to share it with others. And I believe, uh, Suzanne, if, before we depart, if you want to put the registration link in the chat one more time for folks. And we really appreciate your time today. Um, we encourage you to join us again next week and spread the word about these webinars and the videos. And we're excited for what this, what the, the kind of conversation that this is gonna um, deepen across Indian country. So with that, have a good afternoon and we'll see you next week.